You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 30th, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Home Environmental Assessments. Our presenters are Ryan Allen Brand and Kevin Kennedy. They're with the Environmental Health Unit at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. So welcome everyone to COLA. Today is August 30th, um, and today we have both Kevin Kennedy and Ryan Allen Brand here with us um, speaking on environmental um, health assessments in the home for asthma patients. Um, Kevin Kennedy is the director of the Environmental Health Program, um, and uh, Ryan Allen Brand um, is the um, healthy Home Program Manager and Environmental Hygienist. The Environmental Health Program at Children's Mercy is a nationally recognized program that provides environmental ha- health consulting, patient case management, research, education, training, and analytical services. Um, and the team aims to, uh, to help improve and ad- advocate for the health of individuals with environmentally triggered illnesses. All right, we'll turn the time over to you. Uh, I think Ryan's going to go first, and they'll be kind of switching back and forth. It's true. Thank you very much. Very honored to be here. I'm uh, I'm Kevin, the guy with the longer longer beard. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, <laughs> so I, I too am an environmental hygienist. Uh, along with Ryan, we uh, we have both been here for a while and had the good fortune of working for Children's Mercy and. Uh, working to help patients, so thank you. Ryan, go ahead. So um, th- these are the uh, the folks in our environmental health program. As you can see, we've been uh, 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 a program uh, and a, a program since 2001. We've actually been going into homes since uh, the mid-90s, and uh, we we have on staff right now uh, three environmental hygienists. Anita D. Donna is our uh, health coordinator. She's also a, an asthma educator and a clinical research coordinator. So she's often going to be the one that you uh, might be in touch with initially that when we get referrals uh, either from the hospital or, or anywhere in the community or the region, and there'll be, we'll talk more about that, uh, she would be the one that might be the f- initial point of contact and, and be able to follow up with you. Uh, Dr. Friedman uh, is our medical director, director of the PESU, a pediatric environmental health specialty unit. We'll mention that here in a second, and uh, we work closely with her. Uh, should I just go ahead and take control of the slides at this point, Ryan? So uh, because we've been in existence since 2001, uh, we have been in thousands of homes. We have uh, developed a routine process. We are uh, somewhat unique uh, in the country in that as a health system, we do use environmental hygienists for visiting homes. We have published on the value of that, but uh, in essence, the value is to uh, we send a person with environmental science professional background and knowledge, building science, professional background and knowledge, uh, and specific training in uh, environmental assessment. That person goes with a health educator or health coordinator or uh, maybe a nurse case manager, or respiratory therapist. Some kind of health-focused person goes with the environmental-focused person to visit the home together. And uh, the hygienist, in our case, uh, is evaluating the building potential environmental sources and environmental pathways of, of, of exposure that might be leading to health problems. We work with a wide array of, of uh, patients and uh, disease states. We take referrals from across uh, all aspects of, of our institution as well as from across the community uh, and then um, provide a similar kind of service partly focused on uh, the type of disease and severity of the disease that a patient might have. 
As I said, we are part of the PESU, Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit. There's one of these for every EPA region in the United States. It is specific funding from Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry and EPA to fund both clinical a technical consultant for any provider within the region. Uh, Dr. Friedman is our expert and uh, would be the advisor on environmental exposures. We, Ryan and I, are consultants to Dr. Friedman on the environmental aspect of that. So if you were to call about a uh, environmental concern for a family, a community, a, a building, whatever it happens to be, uh, she might pull us into the conversation or have you talk directly with us about whatever the issue is and, and help try to uh, assist with potentially investigating and ultimately solving whatever that issue is. Uh, again, um, that is provided throughout the region. So just a quick review. Um, for the 2007 guidelines, there was a specific focus on uh, environment for the first time. Uh, uh, it became one of the four uh, pillars of asthma control uh, with a better emphasis uh, in the 2007 guidelines on how to manage um, the environmental aspect of asthma as well as comorbid conditions. Um, along with the emphasis on uh, every uh, patient having an asthma action plan, uh, including in that action plan, of course, is about uh, clinical management and self-management of your disease, but it's also about awareness of your uh, triggers, your environmental triggers, things that might trigger your illness or cause flare-ups that uh, might elevate you in a particular level on your action plan. So it's understanding those environmental components. And then, uh, as you all know, stepping up through uh, the management of the disease but it's really important that patients understand their own uh, environmental exposure risks and what they need to do uh, in order to address those. And sometimes it's, it's about addressing the environment specifically. Uh, so in the 2007 guidelines, there was specific emphasis on uh, the, what the research said up to that point, that there clearly there was this association uh, with exposure to specific things in the environment, obviously those triggers, but it can be other things, irritants, uh, uh, things that in the environment that aren't necessarily a, an allergen or something that it by itself might lead to an immune response. It can be other things in the environment that they aren't necessarily uh, uh, don't recognize that it's, it's a trigger, but it can become a trigger. So sometimes uh, strong fragrances, maybe they weren't a, a trigger before, but now they, they become a trigger because they've been exposed to it. So it's understanding what those are and trying to reduce exposure to them. And the research uh, is pretty clear. If you can uh, reduce that exposure, uh, it's really valuable. The research also emphasizes that it isn't about a single step. It isn't doing one thing. Back in 07 and really since then, uh, there's been a real emphasis that you can't provide a single intervention, for example, a, a common practice for many programs was to give out asthma uh, mattress encasements and, and call it good, thinking that was sufficient for managing dust mites. And we know now that, that uh, the science is pretty clear that, that uh, the one uh, single step or single intervention isn't enough. It has to be multifaceted, multi-targeted, uh, specific to uh, the allergen and where we understand exposure might be. And with dust mites, that isn't now, un it's understood, that isn't just, uh, say, in the bed. That is the whole bedroom, all of the potential reservoirs. It's in the whole house, technically, uh, but there are parts of the house that you, you might focus on. So it's this multifaceted educational service provided in the home, and it's a combination of teaching uh, or enhancing or facilitating or reinforcing self-management, what they learned in the clinic, uh, reinforcing, confirming, did you get an action plan? Let's walk through your plan. How, do you understand how to use your medications? Do you understand what a spacer is and how to use it effectively? Do you have one? Where do you keep the medicines at the home? So it's a whole process of understanding the self-management. Then the next step is understanding uh, the environmental triggers and what tools to reduce uh, those things. And that's one of the things that, that we focus on that, uh, that Ryan will talk about. But this is an, uh, a nice uh, 
triangle of epidemiology for healthy homes to show this relationship between uh, the home environment, the home as environment, and the contaminants and reservoirs that exist there, the agents that might exist in that environment that are uh, the things that um, might uh, lead to a flare-up of asthma and ultimately uh, the patient themselves being the, the host or occupant uh, in a classic epidemiologic triangle. The transport mechanisms common to epidemiology are vectors and fomites, and here we're showing uh, what some of those common vectors are, and then things in the home that represent fomites, the inanimate pathways that are the, the air, the dust, the floors, uh, all the stuff in the that they are exposed to directly that, that is settled on top of things or is in the air aerosolized and being distributed around. In this triangle, we also put some emphasis on the facilitative factors, the things that can uh, allow the allergens and irritants to amplify in the home. And then we also uh, describe and put some emphasis on the exposure reduction methods, the things that, that combined together can help address uh, what these issues are in homes. I want to put some emphasis on certain uh, uh, contaminants and irritants in the home that, that uh, you've certainly heard about, but there's some uh, newer science, uh, clearer science about several of these, and I wanted to emphasize that. This is a nice summary table from uh, a review done by Mark Mandel and Associates uh, clear back in 2011, but it shows an important linkage between dampness and microbial agents in homes. Uh, on the this first column is health outcomes. The second column is a summary of what we know about what the research says about exposure and its association with those health outcomes. This is Institute of Medicine Damp Indoor Spaces and Health, and that showed that uh, there was sufficient evidence of an association with exposure to dampness and these four or five. Uh, health conditions. Uh, in uh, 2008, the World Health Organization came out with an update uh, uh, that showed even more research and studies showing more health uh, conditions associated with exposure to dampness and microbial agents. And then in Mandel's review in 2011, uh, with additional evidence, you can see the, n uh, the number of health symptoms that are now uh, known to be associated with uh, living in chronically damp conditions. I want to point out that starting in 2008 and confirmed in 2011 and confirmed uh, even more subsequently, uh, there's a strong association, now considered a causal association, between living in chronically damp conditions and the development of asthma. Uh, that's a, a, a key a uh, summary of what the research has shown up to this point. And this matters when talking with your patients because there's now credible research about a causal relationship between living in damp conditions and asthma in previously unaffected occupants. And it isn't about exposure to little mold spots that a lot of uh, families and patients get concerned about. It's about living with chronically damp conditions that result in pretty extensive uh, uh, water damage, and then that results in uh, mold colonization, microbial pro proliferation. And actually, uh, one theory then is the microecology, you're all familiar now with biomes in the built environment, but the, the biome of a damp building has been, uh, there's a selective advantage for those agents that are not healthy for people. Uh, if you add water uh, to the space, you're providing a competitive advantage to bad uh, microbes, uh, bacteria, and of course the molds, and these things then thrive and people are being exposed to those agents over time, and it, it clearly leads to significant health problems. And now many cognizant authorities have put out policy documents that say moisture in buildings should be um, addressed within uh, 48 hours to try to manage it as quickly as possible. And routinely what we see uh, is significant moisture problems that have not been addressed and people are being exposed to it. The other thing that's changed a lot is uh, our understanding of indoor chemistry. There's a tremendous amount of new science out in the last five years, but really um, mo even more recently, uh, several focused studies uh, where they're using um, 
a whole lot of advanced uh, air monitoring equipment on indoor environments to really look at and understand the chemical relationships. And it isn't simply about the products people might spray in the air. It is about the combination of those products being used, reacting with uh, the surface products, furniture, carpeting, uh, vinyl flooring, whatever it is, there's a reaction there that produces other products. And then whatever's in the household dust uh, can be a buildup of chemicals. So we now understand there's some 30,000 different chemicals in indoor dust, but only about 280 or so that have been accurately identified and uh, been potentially associated with uh, a health problem. So you're going to see lots of new science about this. Uh, this, this kind of exposure has been going on for about the last four decades. Uh, in first world countries in particular, all these modern building materials are made from this wide array of chemicals, and we're now just starting to understand what people are actually being exposed to. And it isn't just being exposed to it in the air, breathing it, it's also being exposed to it on surfaces, and it's our impact on that as the occupants of a building. And this is just to show you very quickly, 33 of those chemicals in studied in household dust represent these specific types of health problems. So they, they have uh, neurological effects, respiratory effects, they accumulate, they have uh, digestive effects, Im immunological effects, a whole host of effects, and people are being exposed to these on a daily basis in the accumulated dust in their home. And we really don't have a good sense of how much... Uh, uh, of these chemicals are in individual homes. We just know from the studies that have been done, they appear to be in every home. And the monitoring that is done by uh, the CDC of blood and urine shows that uh, the vast majority of people in the United States have traces of this in their blood and urine. So we know people are being exposed. Uh, and that's going to be a, a significant risk to be concerned about. We also know that third-hand smoke is clearly an exposure risk in homes where maybe someone has smoked and stopped smoking. You have the chemicals from environmental tobacco smoke or secondhand smoke that have absorbed into the surfaces and clearly are there for long periods of time. And people are being exposed to these uh, residues that actually, as the house eats up, heats up, they can be re-off-gassed back into the environment where people are being exposed to them again. And in this study by DiCarlo and others, they did a, a specific chamber study to look at the specific mechanisms for how these uh, 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 semi-volatile chemicals from uh, tobacco residues are re-volatilized and then how they actually interact both with the surface and surface chemistry, whatever's on the surface, and uh, react with uh, furniture and other things uh, in the room. So uh, it's worth reading, but the, the overall key point here is that uh, people are uh, dealing with a, a long-term exposure to the chemicals from smoke. It isn't simply about that immediate environmental smoke in the air. I want to put a, a, another emphasis on uh, the new, uh, or newer science related to PM 2.5 or 2.5 micron particles and smaller. This is the inhalable fraction, and uh, there's a lot of new science on that. This also recognizing that there's a large amount of fine and ultrafine particulate in homes that is generated from our activities and represents now the EPA says one of the top five health threats for all people, but in particular those with respiratory distress, uh, this is a real significant concern. So that's, that is uh, moisture, chemicals, and particles are really our areas now of emphasis as far as indoor exposure, and uh, there's a lot of, of new science out on some of this. And what we we understand is that people are exposed to these settled dust and particles. The breathable fraction is the majority of what's there. People can't see it. It's what they breathe. And it gets kicked up into the air constantly through our human activity. Uh, uh, this uh, Toby and Farrow uh, article looked specifically at and monitored as people did daily routine and daily activities and just showed uh, the process of routine activities uh, kicks a wide array of particles into the air that then people are exposed to. And um, uh, Brian has measured uh, across uh, hundreds of homes now. We measure uh, uh, 
particles in the indoor environment at different size ranges, and we have shown a statistically significant difference between what is in the child's breathing zone and what's in the adult's breathing zone. We've also shown if you go into that environment, like a kid's bedroom, and measure particles in the air, you get one value, and then if you go around and literally pat the surfaces like a child playing in the room or or disturb the surfaces, you re-aerosolize a large portion of those particles and there's again a statistically significant difference in the air concentration of fine ultrafine particles before and after disturbance. So you might go into a space, a, an adult, a, a, a parent might go into the space and think, oh, this is in pretty good shape. But if the kid goes in and plays on all the surfaces, they've now created an exposure zone for themselves. So cleaning and the reducing of particles and chemicals in the house is really important. It isn't just about uh, minimizing the the allergen reservoirs. That, that routine cleaning becomes uh, essential in trying to reduce all of that breathable fraction. Uh, just a quick touch on um, some of the latest review of the literature related indoor exposures and exacerbation of asthma. Uh, we now know uh, from this 2015 review, so this would be uh, an update from that Mundell review, this Ken Chung Kitafon uh, review looked at uh, and updated the 2000 review, uh, Clean Indoor Air and Asthma. Uh, and show what the research now shows some 15 years later, there is sufficient evidence of a causal relationship uh, with exposure to dust mite allergen and exacerbation of asthma in children sensitized. Uh, there's a causal relationship between cat allergen exposure and exacerbation of asthma, cockroach allergen exacerbation of asthma, sufficient evidence of a causal association, slightly less evidence but still significance related to dampness and dampness related agents and exacerbation of asthma, and outdoor uh, fungal exposure and asthma. So uh, some clearly the relationship uh, of exposure to these is important in um, managing the disease, but more specifically those that might be allergic to uh, one of those. And then there's sufficient evidence of association, I think you all know this, related to environmental tobacco smoke exposure. We know it's uh, now third-hand smoke makes that even more significant. Endotoxin, which is a byproduct of indoor bacteria, that's that chronic dampness and how it changes the microecology of a home. Dog allergen and then brief exposures to nitrogen dioxide have been associated with um, uh, having an irritant effect, uh, and there are several of these potential uh, chemical irritants that come from people's daily routine, but nitrogen dioxide, there's sufficient evidence to show this relationship. And that's a commonly a combustion byproduct from um, uh, uh, gas stoves, gas appliances that, that are poorly ventilated. Uh, I want to point out that there there is a uh, this review from the National Governors Association that shows the value of home visits, uh, that it, it's, these are the keys to uh, successful self-management of asthma. It's, it's self-management education, and it, then where needed, home visits for uh, those that are not controlled through other routine strategies. So our governors are telling us uh, we need to fund these, we should be doing these things. Uh, the investment in uh, self-management education home visits pays for itself, and there's quite a bit of literature to support that. Uh, in uh, uh, 2016, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with this uh, a great uh, overview of indoor environmental control practices for asthma management, and uh, the press described it as uh, clean indoor air being as important as medications in controlling asthma, because it fundamentally showed that by reducing exposure, and the key here, matching the interventions, the home interventions to a child's IgE or, and skin allergy tests, uh, you see a significant reduction in uh, symptoms to the point where uh, it's as efficacious as uh, putting them on certain medications because you're eliminating exposure. They're not being exposed to these things. Uh, they're not uh, seeing flare-ups or they're not seeing an immune response. 
The nice thing also about the this uh, indoor environmental control practice and asthma management article is it, it gives some examples of a good sample environmental control plan uh, and how to draft one of these plans. It's it's really nicely done. It talks about, and this is a really great in that you, you think about that patient and set goals. What are your goals? If you understand your environmental exposures, what are your goals in order to eliminate uh, exposure? We need to know what your goals are and then set actions to meet those goals. That that's our, that's our intent. So it, it does a very nice job of laying that out. Here's some additional example from that. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend seeing that. You may have to go to the online version, and uh, this control plan might be a supplement. There's a link on here that you can go to, but it's a uh, really nice summary. Uh, you are also aware that they, of course, updated the asthma guidelines uh, in 2020, and in that update, there were some interesting changes uh, related to environmental intervention. Um, it, it got complicated, unfortunately. So as they reviewed uh, a lot of the research uh, up to this point, they, they did make these recommendations in individuals with sensitization or symptoms related to exposure. Um, they do recommend integrated pest management as a multi-component uh, allergen specific allergen specific mitigation and then individuals sensitized uh, related to indoor allergens they recommend a multi-component allergen specific mitigation strategy so you understanding which allergens are relevant and then making sure the goals and the actions recommended are specific to that allergen and in those uh, uh, where there's sensitization related to dust mites they conditionally recommended the cases only as a part of multi-component interventions. Like I said before, the, and this is just an update and confirming that it, you can't do single component intervention. You can't merely give uh, people mattress encasements. You have to do a multifaceted, multi-targeted uh, home intervention program for them. And then uh, this is from that uh, updated guidelines showing where the evidence favors the interventions. But what's interesting, uh, when you look at it deeper, there was a 2018 systematic review to support the updated guidelines, and uh, they, they found some real challenges. They actually lowered the strength of evidence for some of these interventions, partly because of the design of their review process. It was, and they say this in the guidelines or in this article, that they changed um, the review of these uh, uh, the research evidence, their approach was different from other previous approaches, and the evidence didn't show itself to be as strong, and they explain uh, why based on that review design. But they point out some important things that we have seen in the studies ourselves, and we've actually, Ryan and I, uh, uh, published a review in 2018 called Environmental uh, management and, uh, and allergic disease, and the same challenge, there's a high level of heterogeneity in the studies, um, a wide array of, of uh, uh, study designs, uh, 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 odd things where, where they enrolled a whole bunch of people, but they didn't actually, uh, in enrolling them, they enrolled everybody. When they did their uh, allergy testing, they found a, lot, a portion of those that they enrolled didn't really have the allergy, and yet they still provided the environmental intervention, so the, re the study ended up being weaker than one might have expected. So, so if you're going to enroll people in a study, you really need to uh, make sure that they are, in fact, allergic to the thing that you're planning to provide an environmental intervention for to, to see if you see uh, a reduction in symptoms associated with actually having that allergy. Uh, they found that a lot of programs had difficulty implementing properly and completing because of cost, language, technology, homeownership, et cetera. Boy, no kidding. Uh, that is exactly a huge challenge for our program, and all of those things have been a, a, a challenge. There's a reluctance by families. There are language barriers, technology barriers, especially now as we do virtual assessments. And then uh, being able to do the work in the home depends on who owns it and wh whether you get permission to do so. Lots of uh, problems there. And then variability in the, base, the basic clinical or, or the baseline clinical characteristics. So uh, there it's about the specific uh, baseline conditions for the individual patients that were enrolled in the studies. That created some challenges, so tremendous variability. Some patients had no symptoms and yet were enrolled in a study. So lots of, uh, of challenges related to how the environmental research has been done. So 
uh, one good thing you should look up is this article by Joyce Sue and, and colleagues. It's about the economic evidence uh, related to self-management of asthma and home-based interventions. And they did a review of all of the programs around the country. And uh, it's actually quite good article. They looked at some uh, 42 uh, programs in our region that do self-management and home-based interventions. Uh, 17 of them they focused on, and, and in there there's a whole summary of all the programs uh, showing this kind of a table. This is the one for Children's Mercy, but it, the nice thing about it is it shows you specifically what types of interventions were recommended and what kind of outcomes each of these programs saw and, and what kind of savings per patient. So uh, very useful to go through that. And then uh, you can see, uh, based on the analysis that was done uh, for us, this was the last time we did this review was in 2010, and uh, we saw some pretty significant savings. Uh, it's not about environment alone. It is about the comprehensive program that uh, patients enroll in, and uh, Ryan's going to talk to you more about that. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Can you hear me okay? Kevin? I can, yes. All right, excellent. I'm going to take control here. Thank you. just want to make sure everybody can hear me before I start. All right. So uh, Dr. Jill Hansen was one of our fellows, uh, number and she worked on a predictive model here, as you can see, um, looking at um, children with asthma and trying to figure out uh, if their uh, visits to the ED, the urgent care, inpatients uh, could be predictive of future um, visits. And so they looked at um, up around 11,000 patients uh, between 2009 and 2013, as you can see here, uh, 12 months prior and 12 months after. And so these were all, uh, they looked specifically at asthma-related acute care visits. <clears throat> so, for this particular um, model, and, and you can kind of see this, there's the historical care, acute care visits on the bottom, and you've got your probability of future uh, care visits on, on the left side, um, which are in the 0.1 all the way up to 1 scale. Um, as you go up in historic acute care visits, and just as one example, if a child has two, then their probability is around 0.45 or 45 percent of a probability that they will have future acute care visits. And as you go up here uh, at four um, on the acute care visits, then their probability is about 0.75 and then on up um, at five or plus, you're around the 85% probability that they will um, continue to come in um, and have these acute care visits, unfortunately. On this particular graph, um, you can see that also the historical acute care visits are on the bottom. You've got your, <clears throat> excuse me, your probability of outpatient visits and uh, the bulk of those, <clears throat> excuse me, of those kiddos that are, were seen um, outside of the, the uh, acute care um, are in that first column, that first part of the histogram. But as kids continued to come in to have their, their routine visits, that number, that number went down. And so we see within our department, um, all more often than, than not, unfortunately, where uh, kids are using the ED for their visits. And so, you know, trying to change that, um, that behavior and get these kids into their acute care visits or even have a primary care, that's another challenge where they're, maybe they don't have a primary care and that's maybe one of the motivations here. Um, but sort of flipping that and trying to get more kids into the acute care visits, routine visits, so that they can better manage their, their asthma. Um, that's kind of the direction that um, we're hoping to go here. So what came out of this was the high-risk asthma protocol. And so this is something that um, my, our coworker, Anita, 
uh, works with weekly on um, during what they call the air clinic on Thursdays. And so uh, as, as, as time allows, they try to see as many um, patients within this clinic and typically all of them are high-risk asthma patients. And so <clears throat> on our side, um, from the referral all the way through um, follow-ups, you know, we're providing education. Um, that's part of, and I'm sure that's a part of all, you know, all the providers uh, that may be on the call today of what, what you see as well. And so trying to provide them um, those, you know, maybe the, the ACT score, the plans for better managing, managing their their asthma along the way. And and we'll talk a little bit more about asthma control tests, but we find that, you know, a lot of kids don't even have that or um, have been exposed to that for whatever reason. So um, with what what we do with the high-risk asthma protocol or patients, um, we also try to connect them with other groups like listed here, like social work or um, other groups within our, our hospital system or even outside our system depending on what their what their needs are. Um, but we also provide a, um, a consistent and a link between us and the, the referral or the provider as well to provide that feedback back to, um, to that physician about their patient and how they're doing. So <clears throat> our, our awesome asthma educators here, uh, Casey and Helen, um, doing their thing in, in the hospital. Uh, providing uh, a class to a lot of those families that are coming out of inpatient care. And so um, it's, we see where that education um, really needs to be continued as, as we get those referrals. We learn that the families have been through this class. Maybe some of them haven't for whatever reason, for whatever reason, excuse me. Um, but, you know, some families really do need that continued work and and Casey and Helen have been great uh, and been on a lot of calls with us over the years um, even within the last year on a lot of virtual visits that we've done. So as part of the referral process um, this is an example of what our uh, process looks like internally and so and I can send this these instructions and, and these screenshots shots to you as well if, if, if you would like after the call but um, they, it's pretty straightforward where the provider would go into uh, Fred and order a um, environmental health referral um, based off of, of what those those needs are of the patient um, health wise or environment or both. So um, you all may be familiar with this, the asthma control test. And so this is something that we uh, continually talk to the patients about, the asthma patients, the families about, um, and what that looks like in the last six months, the last year. Uh, Anita does a lot of research uh, after she gets the referral on the patient to see what that health utilization looks like. And as Kevin mentioned, there's a lot of, of, of what we've done in the past is, is look at this data and, and try to, you know, make sense of it and, and write some papers on it over, over time. And so we just, we try to get a good uh, feel of what, um, where the, the patient is at the time of the referral and kind of where we need to go from there and, and what maybe what those goals are in the future. Um, another survey that we use and that we developed a number of years back is called the Tell Us About Your Home. And so it's a very short survey that we go over the phone with, uh, with the family. It's in red cap so we can send it to them if needed. And so it, it really uh, looks at um, potential exposure to certain things in the home over time. And so this is just a little bit um, <clears throat> up close and personal uh, <clears throat> look of it. So we're looking at uh, you know, do they have carpeting? Uh, do they smoke in the home? Do they have pets? Do they have uh, rodents or roaches in the home? Some common things that we have seen over the years, and we rate and score this. And so this helps inform us as we uh, look to help this family in the best way we can and to kind of also gauge, um, you know, what those risks are in the home. Do we 
just provide a virtual visit um, or education over the phone, or do we also need to go to the home? So over the last uh, almost two years now, you know, we're, we're doing things differently, uh, a lot more telehealth, uh, virtual visits with families. <clears throat> and so we, um, again, as I mentioned before, provide a lot of education along the way, a lot of case management um, and, and looking at, at ways. And we really have to, a lot of times, have to find unique ways to meet where the families are. Um, and you'll learn later on here about a, a referral system that we use called OneTouch. But um, we found, and, and personally speaking, uh, you know, trying to meet those basic needs so then families are a little more open to addressing some of these other things that we might see in the home. Uh, a lot of what we, we do, too, is, um, is benefit or supported through uh, community benefit and um, as part of the hospital's, um, uh, you know, goals for the community. And then uh, we also try to support what we do through, through grants. And um, again, uh, we've written research papers and, and um, uh, some grants have also been research-based as well. So looking back, and we talked a little bit about acute care visits in, in Dr. Hansen's um, paper that she wrote, um, we're looking, uh, and this has kind of developed through that too a little bit, where we're looking at those past utilizations. We're looking at their current um, asthma status. We're looking at the um, tell us about your home survey, that environmental risk survey. And that really helps us determine where we should put them within our risk level. And, and you can see this on the far right where it's low, medium, high, or severe. A lot of the high-risk asthma patients that we work with, those are naturally going to be at the higher severe risk automatically based off of their past utilization and, and, and whatnot. And so <clears throat> I know Kevin, as you, as you heard before, was talking about uh, some of the interventions. And so looking at, and we'll talk about this too, uh, where, you know, the child has a allergy to dust mites um, or maybe we find that they have a sewer backup. So there's, there's other factors here that um, may not even be listed or captured on this Tell Us About Your Home, maybe some unique things that bump up that risk level for that family. So as we look to stratify those families from one to four being four of the higher risk uh, and we've seen this over time where most of our patients we are about 70 percent or so are following within that low medium risk category and so in the past and, and really in the future we're we're trying to find uh, ways where we're working with community health workers to deliver those services for those or doing the visit for those low risk patients, um, and that frees Anita and I up to do some of the more higher severe risk <clears throat> patients uh, visits. Um, so when we do these visits and have done these visits over time. Um, each risk level is getting a, a visit, a virtual assessment, a visual assessment, if you will, um, provided education, tailored education um, to really hopefully meet those needs of, of those families um, and, and what, their, what those challenges are. And then also providing feedback back to those families on what they, what they can do to help improve those conditions in the home. Um, and then continued follow-up. Now, as we look at the higher severe risk patients, as you see here at the, the closer to the bottom here, the 30%, uh, maybe we need to do a more deeper dive into what's going on in the environment, better characterize the environment, which may uh, um, we may need to go to the home to do an in-person visit, to do take our Ghostbuster equipment and uh, assess for particles and contaminants as, as uh, Kevin mentioned earlier. And a lot of, of what we've done before, obviously, a lot more uh, in-person meetings before, where uh, we look to review the cases that come in 
to our department. And so Anita and I work closely and have worked closely uh, together for the last 14 plus years on a lot of these cases. And so um, we have gotten a bigger group together in the past, uh, social workers or uh, legal aid, um, outside organizations as if they were part of a grant program sort of managing minor home repair. Uh, but we, we really try to get additional input on what's best for this family. Um, does the family need just education over the phone? Because uh, we may get a referral that's no, there's no health conditions. It's just basic um, concerns, um, you know, environmental concerns in the home. Um, but later on, we might find, as, as we continue to work with the, the family, there may be some additional um, challenges that, that they need help with. <clears throat> so after COVID, you know, we're doing a lot of, a lot of our visits and meetings online, um, but still providing uh, education along the way and virtual home visits or in, I've done some in-person visits as well. So this is an example of a timeline that we that we use uh, with our lower risk asthma patients. And so what we found over time uh, with this multi-touch model <clears throat> is we continue to keep the families engaged, they stay engaged. Continue with that uh, communication. Um, sometimes it's hard, you know, prepaid phones, uh, can't get in touch with them one week. Uh, you know, in the next month, we can finally get in touch with them. Families that prefer email versus compared to phone calls, we, we see that sometimes. Or they don't have email, or they don't have technology. So we try to meet the families where they are um, uh, as, as needed. And then doing follow-ups, doing uh, asthma control tests every 30 days as, as we work with the families to kind of see what, engage what, where they are. Have they made changes in the home? So with the lower risk, we're working with these families up to about four months. Um, with higher severe risk asthmatics, then that's, as you may uh, naturally uh, suspect, that's going to be a little bit further out because their health is a little more complicated or a lot more complicated or their environment complicated to put them at that higher risk. And so six months, um, maybe even longer, we're working with these families. And again, asking those environmental questions uh, and health questions along the way to see what their utilization looks like and see what their environment um, continues to look like over time. Because some families just need a little bit more hand-holding. This is an example of that uh, of our multi-touch model. Uh, I'm ha we're happy to share forms if you want to see a little more in depth of what that looks like. But um, this is something that we've, we've had for a long time and we've, we've really gotten it down on paper now to, um, to uh, even since COVID because we were building that virtual model since COVID. And this really lays it out nicely what that, what those touches look like from the referral, calling to the family, all the way up to that fifth visit or so. And again, we may need some more visits depending on, on what the severity looks like for those, those kiddos. Um, so continuing to talk about that multi-touch, so the phone visit um, and, you know, sort of introduction, why are you calling? <laughs> A lot of families do know why we're calling. They, they've been informed about the referrals. Some of them have not. Some of them have just gotten out of the hospital and are not ready for us, right? And so we, uh, and that's, that doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. And, and so we have to have to give them the space to kind of get settled back into the home and, and kind of go from there to, and again, meet them where they are and just let them know that we're here as a resource. And, and when they're ready to talk and, and want some additional help, well, you know, we're there. And so we provide a lot of education, but again, a lot of tailor educated education along the way to hopefully uh, address some of these triggers in the home um, and maybe for the first time and, and you know, that they're learning about, you know, what are, what are triggers? I don't quite understand. And so as Kevin mentioned, there are some challenges with language barriers. Luckily, we have access to interpreters. We've used them for uh, a number of years now in the home or even virtually. And so um, that's something that we can we can get I can get an interpreter pretty quickly if if I need it to call uh, call a family, which has been really helpful. So as we continue with, and this is an example of our virtual assessment <coughs> process, um, and really 
for um, for our program, that's kind of where we're we're continuing. And so, any family that comes into uh, as a referral, we're going to start with this process. And as we find that the need is is much greater, where um, they may need an in person visit because of the environment or the child's health, then you know we we make that call. Um, as you know case by case <clears throat> so as an example of our, our second touch or our virtual assessment um, a lot of what we're doing is just following the family's lead taking us around the home with their phones and uh, showing us those uh, main issues uh, concerns that they have but also looking at other issues one thing that to mention on this is what I found is um, that really kind of gives the, the family a different perspective of what their home looks like um, in the you know going back two years or longer you know we go into a home we do a walkthrough and that's that's it there's some education a little bit along the way but this really gets them thinking a, a lot more about the home looking at the furnace and all that um, keep moving here so the visit that we would do would be the, the the healthy home advisory plan we used to call it report delivery we're you know evolving um, so we're providing them advice that's what we're doing <clears throat> on what was good uh, what we recommend these are the the goals or the steps that um, we would like to see you take if you need additional help um, that's where the one touch survey comes in, into play possibly or maybe there's again some grant that we can help um, provide some additional assistance on uh, speaking of interventions, uh, this is a Healthy Home Kit example of what we've provided to families in the past or currently, uh, depending on what their needs are. <clears throat> a lot of families are sweeping. They don't have vacuums. So um, the importance of providing uh, multifaceted, as Kevin mentioned, a multifaceted approach to addressing some of these issues in the home, a vacuum, allergen covers, furnace filters, cleaning supplies, all these things are, are potentially going to go a long way to helping um reduce or maybe even potentially remove some of these triggers in the home for the family. Continuing on with the multi-touch model, <clears throat> doing follow-up calls or emails depending on what's preferred by the family, kind of a check-in to see how they're doing. Um, and depending on what their risk level is, we're going to continue that follow-up call. So on the home environment side, we're looking at the house as a system. We're looking at all these excuse me, different components inside and outside the home. <clears throat> looking at the mechanical system, looking at the appliances, the safety parts of this of the home. <clears throat> As Kevin mentioned, you know, a lot of of uh, the newer research and what's being suggested, you know, the chemicals in the home, the particles. Go ahead. I think Jordan tried to tell me something and I cut him off. Um, <clears throat> I think we just had somebody join, um, but it oh, looks okay. like they're muted now. So oh, okay. carry on. Wasn't George. <laughs> so uh, all these are potential um, exposures in the home. So we look at uh, smoke alarms. We Do they have a gas stove? Do they have a vent? Does the vent work? Do they use it? Um, where's their water heater? What does it look like? Uh, what's my water heater? So there's you know, again, sort of uh, training these families, like looking at their homes differently, and what are these potential concerns that are potentially serious to life and health in the home? Because we've seen it where these electrical boxes are open and exposed, and potentially anybody could, you know, uh, be exposed to that. So we talk to families about the keep it principles, keep it dry, keep it clean. You can, I'm not going to read all these, but um, you kind of get the gist here. Uh, all these are interconnected. So I talked about the house as a system. A lot of what goes on outside can affect the inside of the home. Same thing here. A lot of what, uh, you know, if there's a, a you know, moisture, then that, that can attract pests. That could cause mold or bacteria to grow. Um, but this, this, these are <clears throat> components or principles that we look at as we evaluate or assess a home. And this is an example of a, a, a form that we use as we rate and score um, our assessment process. So we're, we're looking at these potential exposures to fragrances um, that we may know before we even go out to the home virtually or in person. Um, do they have issues with their, you know, their sewer or chemicals that they use? Do they have little kids? So there could be another safety component to that. 
<clears throat> a, a lot of this, too, could be connected with maintenance. And families that we work with, they don't always own their home. And so another sort of, uh, you know, challenge with working with landlords and, and addressing some of these things. But part of that, too, is maybe behavior related. And so, again, we want to mention what was good in the home and, and how, do we, how do we frame it in a way where we're not just, we want them to get rid of all their supplies. We want to provide them options so they can feel like, oh, you know, these, these guys aren't too bad. <laughs> we're, you know, they're giving me some alternatives to, you know, my bleach or my pine sol. So, as I mentioned before, we may need to go to the home to do some measurements or testing. This, this is just an example of, of a lot of the data that we uh, input into our report, um, and, and we color code it, and we rate it and, and score it, what was good, okay, or concern, and then we provide that feedback back to the family. I don't know if we have time for this, but um, this is, you know, you guys can look at this later, but, uh, you know, look at, even look at your own home and see, you know, what looks different or, you know, how do, it, does this look okay, you know, compared to this, to this room? So, um, you know, I think you may look at your homes a little bit differently after this, this talk today, if you haven't already. Um, so we want to provide feedback back to the family. So this is an example of what that report may look like, looking at individual rooms, providing them, again, um, a step-by-step -step, um, way to help address low-cost or no-cost ways to help address some of these issues or these risks or hazards in the home. Um, so that's part of it, right, the, the feedback. But then we have the part of the interventions, uh, which could be just the uh, healthy home supplies. Or if there's funds outside of our hospital or even with our group to provide some minor home repair, all these can make a huge difference in, in the child's environment and potentially their health. Over time, um, uh, with Minor Home Repair, we've looked at, at uh, where we've spent those funds, and you can kind of see from percentages, we're looking, we, we've done a lot of work on, not us, but contractors uh, have done a lot of work on furnace repair, cleaning, um, addressing some of those upholstered uh, or areas that where the dust mites can potentially proliferate, carpeting, um, changing out carpeting or cleaning. So you, you kind of get the, the idea here of some of those top areas that we spent some time on. Um, <clears throat> and then another big part of what we do is provide feedback back to the primary care physician or medical team um, to give them the information on what's going on in the home and, and kind of where the family is with that. Kevin, do you want to talk about this, or do you want me to? Uh, just very briefly, uh, this is just a recent analysis uh, pre-COVID of families who participated in our program, and it really what it just shows is a significant reduction in utilization and a significant cost savings, and you can look at the numbers here. But the key is this isn't just about our work. It's about uh, the comprehensive uh, um, high-risk asthma protocol, all the components in that service, whether it's what Helen does is working with patients, uh, what our role is, connecting with social work, comprehensive effort at addressing addressing uh, the family and helping them better manage the asthma and identify problems in the home. And the emphasis here was just uh, that um, uh, people don't always do what you ask them to do. And this was a paper that uh, Dr. Portnoy and uh, Reben Cater, one of the fellows and I, uh, did a couple of years ago that just looked at specifically what people were willing to do and uh, their likely adherence to what they had said they would do. And in a lot of cases, it was fairly low. It just depends on what they're being asked to do and their, A, their understanding of it and then their willingness to do it. We may want to... Go ahead and quickly mention OneTouch, and then we should sure. stop. Yeah. So uh, OneTouch is a referral system that is housed on the Kansas City, Missouri Health Department's website. Uh, we got a grant through the Health Forward Foundation a number of years back, and we are working with our community partners uh, within Kansas City to provide uh, quick uh, referrals to them or even to us um, based off of some of those basic needs uh, for those for those families around health 
energy, um, hygiene products, um, you know, food insurance. So this is just a, a referral guide um, looking at some of those, uh, those specifics um, as well as those contacts. So we have that for the Missouri and the Kansas side. And then we can do statistics and we look at those statistics to see kind of where those referrals are going and provide feedback back to those other organizations. Uh, we also offer training. I can follow up on that later. And there is a new reference guide if you're interested, a healthy home reference guide that uh, I can also follow up on if you are interested in getting a copy of that. Thank you all. All right. Thank you, Ryan and Kevin. We appreciate it. Um, and we are out of time, but it looks like you uh, so kindly put your email addresses there. Um, so if anybody has uh, questions, um, I know that you guys would be okay with them reaching out via email. Yeah, absolutely, anytime. Please email us about anything. Thank sure. you so much Sounds for being great. here. Yeah, Sounds like you guys have really increased the program. Congratulations. Doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, all. Sir. Have you... Uh, have you taken the pollen sense into the homes yet? Not yet. Uh, we're trying to just get it set up on the building and then uh, uh, get into homes when it's safe, get into homes and schools when people feel comfortable and safe about it. But that is uh, planned for the future. We do have a research device that's ready to go into homes. Yeah, we it have seems to be working on the building now, so thanks for doing that. Sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.